So if you want to have a grasp of all the transport in the show tonight, make a date and grab the Thursday edition of the BNFT and you'll be able to see all that happened here on the show tonight. And we're sure also going to be getting interactive with you along the line. And so all you have to do is send us your messages and comments via our dedicated WhatsApp line, which is 0559-019-177. At the appropriate time, we shall also activate the phone lines for you to call in and contribute to the discussion. We are streaming live on our social media pages. On Facebook, we are streaming live at Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority. Still on Facebook, we are streaming live at Port of Tema. And on YouTube, we are streaming live at Eye on Port. Eye on Port. My name is Kennedy. More now. We are going for a quick break. When we we'll bounce back, we will continue with the show. Please stay with us. Every now and again, Goyle makes good things happen. This time, Goyle has introduced Super XP Run 95, a higher grade fuel loaded with additives and yet sold at the same price as normal fuel. Goal Super XP Run 95 enhances engine performance like never before. It maintains the engine by keeping it clean from carbon deposits. Goal Super XP Run 95 is designed to burn slowly and thus improves fuel economy, making you save money after several kilometers. Goal Super XP Run 95 gives you a smooth driving experience that is less vibrations. Fill up with Goal Super XP Run 95. Now there's no need to pay more for any higher grade fuel. Goyle has that sorted. Goyle, good energy. Because you see, without our taxes, we wouldn't have good roads, good schools, better hospitals, street lights, and other very important social amenities. When we pay our taxes, we give our children free and quality education. Tell God, my money too small. Why should I pay my tax? Look, small. Salifu, it doesn't matter how small or big your business or income is. You still have to pay your taxes. The little taxes from each and every one of us, when put together, could give your community clean water. Or that deprived school with tables and chairs. Please pay your taxes. It is your responsibility. It is your civic duty. It is the law. Impressive factory. If only I had listened to you, I wouldn't have been in this mess. That devastating fire virtually wiped out the whole factory and my warehouse. Remember my misfortunes last year? Serene insurance assets all risk fire policy that I took were there to pay for my damaged stocks in the warehouse. And my machines that were affected by the flood have been replaced. My accident vehicle is back on the road. Thanks to Serene Insurance Motor Policy. Suddenly my goods are on the IC covered with their marine cargo insurance policy. I was just telling Ajima about Serene Insurance. Oh, Ajima. Tell him more. As a road contractor, I make sure I do my Contractors all risk insurance for the projects and then workers' compensation for all the workers on site with Serene Insurance. They will make sure they will cover your unknown tomorrow today. Serene Insurance, a new face of insurance. Call us now. MPS Terminal 3 is Africa's new state-of-the-art container terminal at Tema Port. For manufacturers, agro-processors and traders, the new port means business can be done faster. This infrastructure boost will improve Ghana's port handling capacity, connect more trading routes and oil the engine of growth for the economy, creating greater opportunities across all sectors as Africa's markets merge and become the largest trading block globally. MPS. We connect. You thrive. All right, so you're welcome back. It's now time for us to take a look at happenings in the port and shipping industry in the course of the week. And in the course of the week, the uh, Burkina Faso uh, Shippers Council had calls to open its new office in the port of Tema. It opened a very brand new ultra modern uh, office complex in the port of Tema. But the fact that uh, US Coast Guard has also visited the uh, port of Tema on ISPS duties. Let's take a look at these stories and more. 
The headquarters of the Burkina Faso Shippers Council, also known as the CBC in Ghana, has been inaugurated in Tema, which will serve as the administrative center for the council's activities in Ghana. The three-story ultra-modern office complex situated within the Tema port enclave is expected to boost trade and transport facilitation related to the transit business between Ghana and Burkina Faso. The commissioning ceremony brought together government officials and shipping sector stakeholders from both countries. Speaking at the ceremony, the Ghana rep for the Burkina Faso Shippers Council, Dennis Bado, thanked all actors responsible for the completion of the project. A vous tous, distingués invités. Indeed, through these achievements, you are giving this beautiful city of Tema a remarkable infrastructural pool and facilitating the transport chain and thus trade between Burkina Faso and the Republic of Ghana. The director of Port Tema, Sandro Poku, assured that the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority will continuously enhance all measures that will sustain and prosper the transit trade. We began with the provision of land to the transit representatives to build offices and warehouses to support the administrative and operational activities. In our bid to reduce the cost of doing business in our ports, especially for our transit customers, rebates are granted on cargo volumes and 21 days rent free for all transit cargos. We have also automated our ports processes to reduce delays. The board chairman of the Burkina Faso Shippers Council, Al Hassan Seinu, said the construction of the building is part of a vast infrastructural program embarked on by the governing body of the CBC through its strategic development plan of 2014 to 2018. It was in 2011 that the administrative and port authorities of Ghana were pleased to grant Burkina Faso through the Burkina Bay Shippers Council this space of 3,075 meters squared to build the headquarters of the CBC. Here we are today at the realization of this ambitious project that we have initiated together. Deputy Transport Minister Frederick Obing Adam called for strengthened collaboration towards the shared objectives of both countries. As we see here, the commissioning of this edifice, it is also to foster and also to encourage the objective as we have with the African continental free trade area, which seeks to also reduce poverty and share prosperity between member countries. According to the Minister for Transport for Burkina Faso, Roland Somda, the edifice will enhance the Burkina Faso Shippers Council operations and help it deliver on its mandate. De saluer et de féliciter l'ensemble des acteurs to ensure a regular supply of products, goods and various commodities to Burkina Faso in the best conditions of cost, speed and security, to assist the shippers and to protect their interests in the field, to contribute to the competitiveness of the Burkina Bay export products on the international market, to undertake all studies and research in the field of transport for the benefit of shippers and the national economy, and finally to ensure the implementation of measures taken by the state to rationalize the transport and logistics chain. Néanmoins, je voudrais traduire ma reconnaissance. The United States Coast Guard has paid a working visit to the port of Tema to assess the effectiveness of Ghana's implementation of the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code and discussed best practices for the development of mutual interest in the maritime trade. This forms part of the International Port Security Program through which the U.S. Coast Guard assists nations enhance their implementation of the ISPS Code. The team from the U.S. Coast Guard was accompanied by the Ghana Maritime Authority, the agency responsible for enforcing international maritime conventions and national rules and regulations bordering the maritime industry. The delegation paid a visit to the Director General and top management of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, where the two parties expressed their shared interests. Uh, too soon is another time for them to be here to conduct the assessment so that uh, it will help us to you can do even better in the effective implementation of the code. They've been here since uh, Saturday. As you know, we came to the Ghana Maritime Authority head office yesterday and had interaction with uh, my, my director general and his uh, technical staff. Today, as the program 
shows we yeah. are going to be here. And uh, as Ketsi demands, they will have to call on you first to interact with you before we go to the field. And I think as sports, we've taken these reports very seriously. Working with the Ghana Maritime Authority, most of the time after your visits, they send us the feedback and then point out all the areas that needed to be addressed. And we took them quite seriously and, and um, also took all necessary measures to address them. Within the operational areas of the Tema port, the team were briefed on the various processes undertaken to enhance security, such as 24-hour CCTV surveillance, cargo inspection and scanning procedures, access control and coordinated initiatives between GPHA and its allied security agencies. International security specialist with the IPS program, Dean Horton, shared his impression on security processes at the port of Tema. So we do, uh, we do an, an assessment, um, and so we, we have been here uh, uh, all morning in the in Tema port, and um, I've been very impressed. Um, the, uh, for instance, one of the things I'll take away is uh, the use of uh, body cameras on the security personnel. Um, frankly, I, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Um, and so that'll be something that I take away from, from here and uh, share that with other ports uh, so that uh, maybe they can use that and, and improve their security. All right, so it's time for us to now take a look at the word of the day. And today's word of the day is consolidation. Consolidation. Consolidation is cargo consisting of shipments of two or more shippers or suppliers. Container load shipments may be consolidated for one or more consignees. All right, so you're welcome back. We are zooming into our discussion proper tonight, and tonight we're taking a look at how to adopt global best practices towards a corruption-free maritime industry. And this topic comes on the heels of a convention or a meeting held here in Accra, which assembled African countries, and they took insights into what they can do to ensure a corruption-free maritime industry. And so we have our guests. Unfortunately, today we have to do this uh, with our guests, three of them via Zoom. Uh, we're supposed to have Captain um, uh, uh, Thompson from the Ghana Maritime Authority with us in the studios. Unfortunately, he got stuck in Takaradi and uh, couldn't make it to the studio, so he's also joining us via uh, Zoom. I will also be joined via Zoom. I understand we have him on, on, online already, uh, Mr. Soji Apampa, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Convention on Business Integrity, CBI. And uh, we also have Vivek Menon. I understand he's also on, online. Uh, he's an associate, di associate Director, Global Operations and Industry, Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, uh, MACN. And so these are the three gentlemen we'll be doing a discussion with tonight. And so let me go straight to um, uh, Vivek Menon and welcome you. And I also welcome you, Mr. Apampa. Good evening, gentlemen. You are watching us at this time. And you have not yet received. Hello, Vivek. Good evening. Have you muted your microphone? Vivek, have you yes. muted your microphone? Please unmute it if you have. God doesn't want you to remember. Mr. Pampa, can you hear me if you are online? You get into the future, I can you hear you clearly. Good Mr. Soja Pampa. Plan for mankind. I'm responding. No can you hear me, Mr. Pampa? All right, I think we are having uh, connection challenges uh, with the alliance. Okay, hello. Viva, can you hear me? Soji, can you hear me? Well, I think we're having challenges with, with them. We'll, we'll try and uh, uh, establish uh, proper contact with them so we can begin the discussion um, this evening. Remember, we're talking about how to adopt global best, best practices towards a corruption-free uh, maritime industry. And I said the uh, topic came on the hills of a seminar that was held here in Ghana uh, recently, and uh, these people were part of it. They actually were some of the key stakeholders that took part in it, together with the Ghana Maritime Authority. And so we have three guests tonight who are all going to be participating in the discussion via Zoom. 
Uh, we have Captain William S. Thompson, who is Deputy Director uh, of Service and Inspection at the Ghana Maritime Authority. He was supposed to be with us in the studios. Unfortunately, he got stuck in Takrade and uh, has not been able to make it. And so he's also going to uh, join us via Zoom. And uh, we also have Mr. Soja Pampa, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Convention on Business Integrity, CBI. Uh, I think he's based in Nigeria. And then we also have Mr. Vivek Menon, Associate Director, Global Operations and Industry, Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, MACN. These are the gentlemen we're going to be doing the discussion with. Yeah, uh, we have uh, Vivek and we have uh, Mr. Soji on the line already. Uh, Vivek, can you hear me now? Vivek. Mr. Yes, Pampa, are you online? Loud and clear. I'm online. Can you hear me? Yes, yes okay. Very online. good. Vivek, you are online. So let me, let me start with you while we try to establish contact with uh, Mr. Uh, Pampa. Now, I just wanted to tell us briefly about the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, um, how you came about, and the work you've done so far in Africa's maritime industry. Hello, Vivek. Vivek, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes, did, you hear, did you get my question? I could, you need to repeat that one more time. I, I heard you. Okay, well. I just, I just want, you, want you to and tell you us about the African, uh, of the, of the Maritime uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Network, uh, your organization, how you came about and what you've been, that you've been doing so far uh, in the maritime industry on the African continent. Okay. Yeah, I'll go straight to the question. Thank you for that. Thank you for having us here one more time. Um, a quick background for the audience. Uh, the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network was established in 2011. Uh, and it was a private sector initiative, i.e. the Maritime Private Sector Initiative. It came about at the time where the UK Bribery Act uh, came into force and also the FCPA, the US uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, became more stringent. Um, it was also at the time when the shipping industry or the maritime industry had to find ways to put policy or anti-corruption policy more broadly into practice. Uh, what it also means, in other words, is that we wanted to highlight the necessity of leadership to give strategic direction, which was missing, which is often missing, um, to operationalize integrity commitments, or how do you operationalize anti-corruption commitments uh, all the way down to the to the last um, end of the value chain in shipping. So this is one of the fundamental reasons why uh, the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network was established, and more importantly, it is uh, it is important to understand that um, the real shipping companies some which are very big and well established also realize that as an individual company, um, there, there are also limitations uh, to, to, to succeed. Therefore, the idea which started in 2011 was to come together as a collective and see how we can push the bar to address various challenges of uh, ethics and integrity risks that are present in, in the larger maritime value chain. Um, so, so where we are today, if you see, uh, 2011, we were eight companies. Uh, today, we have grown to 180 companies, more than that, actually. So we represent 50% of the global tonnage, uh, the cargo carrying capacity of the vessel. And if you look at the uh, container tonnage, we represent close to 75% of the global container carriage capacity. That's a large group of um, shipping companies, um, some of them are vessel owners, vessel operators, we have cargo owners, we have port agents, flag states, uh, P&I club, insurance clubs as well, who are part of the whole value chain in shipping, which, which represent the, the network uh, today. Um, the philosophy is, is uh, on, on three pillars that we work on. One is we try and build capability, or we try and build the capacity of the private sector that is part of the network to address these challenges. Uh, the second pillar is to work in collective action with government and local private sector as well. It is very, very important to engage government. Um, to work with them is, is fundamental to, to our philosophy. And last but not the least, we need international collaboration uh, in, in addressing this uh, as a holistic, uh, as, a, as a problem is quite holistic. The solutions have to be addressed in a holistic nature as well. So this is very briefly as to give you a background of who we are. We are based in Copenhagen, the Secretariat is based in Copenhagen, and we have local partners across the globe uh, in some of the countries. And this is where Mr. Apampa, who is uh, joining us today, is our local partner in 
uh, Nigeria. All right, so let me just come to that briefly. How many partners do you have in, in, in Africa? Is it only Nigeria or you have several others? In Africa, the flagship project was started in Nigeria in 2012. So right now we only have in Nigeria. That is correct. All right. And so how did you gain so much accept, acceptability within the short period, uh, you know, from 11 members to 180? Yeah, so when we started, it was eight, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, eight companies came together. They wanted to understand. Uh, well, one, one of the things, three things came, came to my, uh, uh, comes to mind from that meeting was, one, they all shared the same pains. And at the same time, they also didn't know exactly what is the golden solution, if there is one at all. And thirdly, they knew that this cannot be a single company exercise. It has to be a collective. Over time, what we have seen is that all the companies who've joined since then, they all share the same pains. Uh, and the pains are very much in terms of vessel clearance when they come to ports. And they were all struggling with this in their own context. They were all struggling with a lack of choice, if I may put it that way, or a lack of solution in the various ports that they touch. And therefore, it became important for them to accept that they are part of the challenge, but as, mu as much as working with government and working with each other, each other could become a potential solution. And that is why I think it was um, fundamental for companies to join us to accept that there are certain principles that we need to, ex we need to work with. And that's, that's also why we see uh, a huge growth in the membership over the period of, let's say, 10 to 11 years. Uh, so this has been some of the reasons uh, why many members have decided to join the network. And also at the same time, they have, uh, they have been able to uh, use the solution that we've been trying to provide in, in certain jurisdictions. All right, before I move to other questions, I just want to find out from you, Mid mentioned the fact that you have about 50% of global tonnage uh, as far as the shipping industry is concerned, and you also account for 75% as far as cont uh, container is concerned, container tonnage. Tell us about that. Yes, so the, the shipping industry, as you know, is, is very global, 90%, close to 90% of uh, global, uh, you know, the global economy moves through shipping by volume, at least 90%. And, and if you look at the broader spectrum of, of shipping, you have different uh, kind of commodities that are being trans transported. You have the, uh, the energy division that transports oil and various other types of gases across. And then you have the container industry, which literally everything that you touch, feel, taste is sitting in, in some form or matter in, in a container or any other ship. Uh, so definitely the commodity trade and the container trade has uh, flourished over a period of time, as we all know. And at the same time, we see that they touch on very many ports globally. Um, and, uh, and this is where I think they've all understood that the risks are quite unique when it comes to certain ports and, and terminals. But at the same time, the, the commonality of challenges are very much the same. And it all revolves around clearing vessels before they can start operations. And... Um, uh, for the for the general uh, knowledge of the audience, the time spent in port is so critical, and the less time in sp uh, tem uh, spent in port is is so important because that is where uh, we we try and see how much the cost of trade really comes out. Because if a ship is delayed due to some uh, uh, de uh, delays in the uh, clearance of the vessel, that has a cost impact for that particular vessel, but also future opportunities. So for container vessels, but also it's common for any commodity carriers, whether it's bulk or liquid form. So, so this, is a, this is where we have been focusing. The, the challenges have been in the ports and terminals, and it, it is quite common for any kind of carriage of goods across the globe. Okay, so- and I hope that, that answers your, your question that you raised. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so that's, that's awesome. I, I reckon the fact that you've been able to do all these things and you have been able to consolidate these gains within this uh, period between uh, 10 and 11 years. But let me, let me uh, come back and find out from you what the ultimate objectives of MACN are. Well, the vision, is, vision for MACN is, uh, I would say, I don't know if it's simple, uh, but it is, it is very clear that we would like a maritime industry which is free from corruption because this is quite uh, it is it is still happening across the globe in various levels because that enables 
fair trade. And why that is important is fair trade benefits a society at large. Uh, with, with what that means is that everyone who is uh, having access to any form of co commodity, it has to benefit them, but also it has to be coming at a fair, a fair, a fair cost. Now, how we, how we put this vision into practice is we have various uh, ways we do it. One is by raising awareness. Uh, we try and implement some common principles that have been adopted and we have co-developed that across the membership. This is something that the private sector, we, we strive in getting the private sector to work on these common principles and we share them as good practices across the industry. We also want to collaborate, as I mentioned earlier, with government the non-governmental organizations, and very importantly, civil society bodies, uh, in order to identify and mitigate the root causes of these uh, challenges, the corruption risks that we see. That is very, very key uh, to our work. And finally, of course, we want to see how we can create um, a business of a business environment which is built on integrity or ethics within the maritime community. Because we strongly believe whether it is maritime or the broader ocean governance or blue economy, the discussion that has been going on uh, for many years now, and especially recently uh, in the conference, the fundamentals is integrity. I think if we can build on the fundamentals of ethics or integrity, I think we will be, uh, we're very confident that we can have the maritime industry or the broader tra trade industry, which will be free of corruption, or it will be an ethical, uh, ethical industry overall. Mm. Now, as you go about your duties, um, you know, across the world, I just want to find out from you, what are some of the common cases of corruption in the industry that, you have, uh, that has come to our attention? Yeah, that's a very important question. And what we focus on, the Matter Anti Corruption Network primarily focuses on is the ports and terminal sector, the interaction between the private sector and public sector. And let me give you an example. Um, and just from a common, uh, common person's perspective, uh, whenever we travel, we ha we meet different public officials um, at different levels. It could be the health official, it could be immigration, customs. So if you come to airport, you clear these uh, public officials and then you, you leave the airport. Similarly, for a seaport, it's a similar exercise. When a ship comes to port, it touches on various public officials, port health, immigration, customs, uh, maritime administration, uh, drug and law enforcement. So we have various public administra uh, administrators coming on board in order to check, uh, which is within their mandate. They need to ensure that the vessel is in compliance to the national regulations and rules and also international regulations and rules. In that process, when there is a lack of transparency in the standard operating procedures, when there is inconsistency in applying standard operating procedures, if there are uh, ones available and if they are transparent, this is where there is a room for um, having unethical demands. And what we see today from a, a, uh, in, in many jurisdictions is public officials tend to use that discretionary power that they have in order to get something from the vessel to clear these um, vessels so that they can start operations. And when those demands are not met, it leads to delays. The clearance is not provided or clearance is withheld documents confiscated from the vessel in the in the context of um, that their vessel has not complied with the rules. So there is a, there seems to be a lack of clarity. As I mentioned, there is lack of transparency in some jurisdictions as well in what should be expected. And therefore, we see the risks are primarily due to delays. But in many cases, also, we have seen there are risks in terms of being harassed uh, to some extent. Also, uh, in some cases, they have been threatened uh, so there are various types of consequences that uh, that ships face when this lack of transparency is being put into practice. So, so those are the kind of uh, you know data that we also collect in in the uh, in the work that we do, which is used to demonstrate to the government or also to the private sector that what is it that they need to be aware of and how they can be well prepared and also how to find solutions. On the ground, so these are some of the problems that uh, that we um, uh, we try and address in the ports and terminals sector. All right, thank you very much, Vivek. Please hold on, uh, don't leave us. Uh, we're going to be with you throughout this show, so are uh, you still on? Let me go and see if I can speak to Mr. Pampa. Uh, if you're on the line, uh, Mr. Pampa, good evening. Good evening. 
Uh, thank you very much indeed. Now we're glad we have it loud and clear. Uh, kindly tell us briefly about the Convention of Business Integrity. We just uh, heard from, uh, you know, uh, Vivek, who says you are the local partner in Nigeria. Tell us about your activities. Basically, um, the Convention on Business Integrity was set up in 1997 to see if we couldn't get a society in which people, especially business people, will prefer integrity over corruption. Because we believe many business people in our climes um, see corruption as an instrument um, not as a moral issue, because many people understand good and bad, right and wrong, but they feel constrained, compelled, if you like, sometimes to do the wrong thing because they feel they cannot survive. So the Convention on Business Integrity not only helps to expose standards, but also works with different stakeholders to try to point to examples of how you can actually do the right thing and survive. That you can actually do business in our environment and survive. So that is what the Convention on Business Integrity is about. We, we, we try to get a level playing field for business um, so that um, those who do the right thing can actually prosper and progress based on doing the right thing. Um, so, um, initially, our relationship with the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network was in providing training. We did ethics training for government officials. In fact, over like a one-year, one-and-a-half-year period, we helped to train over a thousand uh, senior ports officials in Nigeria on professional ethics. But in the course of this, it became clear to us that um, the training wouldn't be enough. Um, you needed to engage uh, and advocate for certain standards to be taken up by the policymakers if you were going to embed um, the right sort of practices that we were hoping will be established. But anyway, that's how we came into relationship with the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network when we were then asked to represent them. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll... In Nigeria. Okay, great. Uh, so far, you are the only African country to have a partnership with, uh, he, he said. Yes, so far. And, you, you know, um, the, the maxim goes that if it can work in Nigeria... It can work anywhere else. Absolutely, yes. Uh, you, you know, yes. you know, as people say, especially yeah. in dealing with corruption. Yeah. So Nigeria was that thorn, which even their members said could you could never get success. Mm. And perhaps what I should add to what um, Vivek Menon said earlier when you asked the question that how come they grew so rapidly? Yeah, it was because of success because they actually made progress in Nigeria. Right. And so if you can make progress in Nigeria on things that are operationally difficult, then it's a no-brainer. Mm. It's a no-brainer. It's, it's a case of, wow, then why are we not doing this in more places? Mm. So I, I think that that really also helped shore up confidence in the work of the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network mm. in that their early interventions were successful. Right. Um, hold on, I'll come to you again, um, uh, Mr. Soji Apampa. But let me find out if Captain Thompson is on the line. Good evening, Captain, if you are there. Hi, Kennedy. Oh, absolutely like. great. Good to, good to have you, uh, Captain. Um, uh, good evening. Uh, good evening, Kennedy. Good evening to Soji. Good evening to be back. Great. Good evening. Yes, so I, I'll go straight away with my question and find out from you uh, what the view of the Ghana Maritime Authority is. Uh, when it comes to the state of ocean governance in our country and the blue economy as well. Thank you. Um, talking about the Ghana Maritime Authority mm. um, and the governance, ocean governance, we just want to pick two things. Um, the authority is only one institution set up by an act, just like any of the other authorities. So even though we are labeled as the regulators of the the regulator, sorry, of the maritime industry, mm. we set up by an act, and then our operations stay within 
the confines of the act. Mm. GPHA, the landlord of the port, is also set up by an act, and it's the same. You have um, GRA, uh, SEPS, you have GIS, immigration, all these are players, but they, they act independent of the authority. So if we are not careful, uh, a different picture is given as if the authority has the total control. Um, having said that, um, if you want to talk about governance, I will want to look at two things, the institutions mm. and then the systems that have been set up by the institutions and the procedures thereof. If you talk about the institutions, I will say in Ghana, we have uh, all, all are in place, I would say so. There's the GMA, there's the, the GPHA itself with all the facilities, GIS, uh, the Port Health, the SEPS and the GRA. Yes, all those are there, but we want to ask um, if the systems that have been set up and put in place by these institutions are fluid enough um, to allow for what uh, my friends spoke about, mm. free flow of cargo, the clearance, the time that ships have to spend in port and all that. Mm. So if I should narrow it to Ghana Maritime Authority, uh, we have a sector and a role to play here. And the way we play, for instance, let me give you the example of uh, the port state control inspections, mm. which is very, very important. Because the power that the port state control officer wields, by that power, he can actually detain a ship for, I don't know, and the laws are there to back mm. the port state control officer. So if you have the wrong person doing the job, he can unduly cause delays. Vivek was referring to before a clearance before operations, but there's clearance after operation as well. If I detain the ship after cargo work and then send it to Anchorage for two weeks unduly, that's also a delay that will affect the operations of the ship. So on our side, I will say that the, well, the other institutions are all in place as to whether the systems and the procedures are, that's the question uh, to be answered. And I will say the procedures that the authority has had to adapt for its role I will say, yes, the authority has put so much in place. And I believe as the discussion goes on, I will have to come in with some of the things that we have done and the principles that we stick to. That is ensuring no delays come from the end of the authority. I don't know if your question is well answered. Mm, absolutely. Uh, still stay with us, Captain. I'll come back to you. But let me go back to uh, Mr. Pampa and find out from you. You heard Vivek mention some of the issues of corruption they uh, identify uh, in the course of their work across the globe. And you are their representatives on the African continent. I just want to find out from you what are some of the typical cases of corruption that arise in the maritime industry in Africa that has come to your attention? Um, okay. So. It, it, it's it's never blatant. Mm. It's it's not usually blatant. Although there are blatant ones mm. when someone demands that in order for me to give you uh, give your vessel a clean bill of health, you have to pay this sum of money. Mm. That is very crude, and uh, the, the 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 officials shy away from that sort. Instead, it starts with an interpretation or a misinterpretation, deliberate misinterpretation of whether or not you have complied with the standard. Mm. So it says, okay, give me the documents, looks at the paperwork, and says, ah, this is not acceptable here in this particular country. But you say, I've been sailing all over the world. Nobody's ever raised this issue. Ah, but here we raise that issue. And by the way, it's going to cost you so much per, per, per crew member. For instance, so it happens a lot on the immigration side that there are debates around what is a travel document, um, what is the standard for a seaman's book or for a passport. And you, you would think that those are fundamental and things that should be clear, but rather there's a lot of debate around it. And sometimes the documents get seized mm. and taken off the vessel. And, and, and you know, that raises panic immediately and then somebody's saying well if you play ball and you pay this we will overlook it this time and you're still arguing that what are you overlooking because i haven't contravened anything 
Mm. But those are the kinds of scenarios that are now very common. So it's it's so you, you have it. Each agency has its own style and its own flavor of of, of what they might come up with. Mm. But also to say on behalf of the officials that sometimes even before they even say anything, they are offered by a jittery captain. They are offered something which should, they should not be offered. So that also happens. Mm. So it's both ways that MACN tries to encourage both the captains not to offer and the officials not to accept, mm. and the officials not to demand, and the captains not to give. So that is the situation. Mm. All right. Let me go back to Captain Thompson before I go, I go to, I move to Vivek. Captain, let me find out from you. Um, you had uh, issues of corruption from both sides, both Vivek and then uh, uh, Mr. Apampa. Uh, tell us. Has there been any occasion where issues of corruption has come to the attention of the Ghana Maritime Authority? And what's the nature of these issues? Um, um, thank you again, Kennedy. Um, like the other speakers have said, it, it comes sometimes with it. Uh, I'll talk about positive control inspections again. So an inspector boards a ship and then he finds out there are ABCD deficiencies. And some of the deficiencies come as violations of, for instance, our Maritime Pollution Act, and therefore is accompanied by some fines, quite heavy sometimes. So let's take, for instance, a fine of $60,000 for some any form of pollution. And... Hello, Captain, are you there? Hello, Captain. All right, I think uh, we've, we've uh, lost Captain. We'll try and, and make contact with him once again. But let me go to uh, Vivek Menon and find out from you, Vivek. If you kindly tell us about your collective uh, action work. Yes, Vivek, if you can tell us okay. about your collect collective action work and public sector accountability framework in Nigeria. And uh, how do you intend to use this model, uh, you know, in other African countries? I hope you can hear me because I just lost the connection for Absolutely. a second. Absolutely. I, I, I can hear you very well, Vivek. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I got your question as well. Thank you for that question. So just to uh, give you an understanding of what we did in Nigeria, um, and I would like to def uh, explain it in maybe five parts very quickly. Yes. Uh, so first of all, we tried to define what the challenge was and some of the points that uh, Mr. Soji also mentioned earlier during uh, his presentation was, all, was also that we tried to do. We tried to define the issue uh, and then find a way to prevent it, detect more concretely what the problems are, basis that, and then find a response mechanism and then see how we can evaluate it. So it is a, it is a, it is a full cycle of understanding how we can find some concrete solutions. And the definition of the problem came around in conducting what we call a corruption risk assessment. It is a very sector specific uh, assessment that was done. As I mentioned, it is the ports and terminals that we are focusing on. That is the expertise that we bring. So together with the, uh, the Nigerian government, uh, and also at that time, the, the tone from the top, from the leadership, uh, this is the presidency's office, was very clear that we need to identify the risks and find a solution that will work in this particular important sector, because um, especially for Nigeria, the ports and terminals are one of the most important uh, service delivery sectors. So therefore the corruption risk assessment, CRA for short, was carried out, which, uh, which basically laid down some integrity plans or integrity commitments mm. that the government had to follow up. With. One of them was to standardize the operating procedures in the ports and terminals. Um, what that means is that in, all the ports and terminals across Nigeria, with the discretionary powers that public officials had in some cases, they were, as Soji also rightly put it, uh, either misinterpreting or interpreting the, the, law, the, the national law into their own ways. Mm. And that should not happen in principle. So it was very important to standardize it. And this was actually done by the respective uh, government agencies themselves. I mean, immigration, ensured that they laid down the standard operating procedures, custom did their own. So it was not us doing the SOPs. It is the respective agencies providing the SOPs for all the people in rank and file. The second step was also um, to, to find a way to 
see how we can consistently apply these SOPs. And this is also something Soji alluded to. Training was provided. More than 1,000 public officials were trained in, in using these SOPs, what these SOPs entailed, because these were made by their own respective heads of agencies. So that is very important. And that br then brings in the prevention element. So if you're trained, if you know how to use the SOPs, if you know what they are, then you will be expected to consistently apply uh, the SOP. So that was a prevention element. But then we also realized that despite all this effort, despite the training, despite standardizing uh, the SOP, there were still uh, challenges. And then we said, okay, how can we clearly detect or identify where the problems are? Again, going back to what Soji said, he gave, gave us the example of immigration. The only way we could identify that in more detail was to establish some kind of a um, ombudsman like concept uh, in in the in the context of when a ship comes to port it is able to not only um, claim that i have a problem but also see if we can get some real time remedies in that process we were able to get two things one is to provide a remedy for the vessel that is struggling with uh, a case but also we were able to get data in terms of where the challenges are the most so detecting the uh, the problems was very crucial, uh, which supports the whole prevention methodology as well. And this is where we work very closely with the government. As as I mentioned earlier, the, the tone from the top was very, very clear. Uh, again, going back to what Captain Williams said, institutions were also very supportive of the work, um, which meant that we were able to place this ombudsman-like concept, that means a real-time resolution team that was uh, that was instilled by the government of Nigeria in in the economic regulator which is the Nigerian Shippers Council to, uh, who actually uh, carries out this uh, these activities with that uh, with that in place we were able to create what we call a response mechanism um, today they call it the port standing task team which uh, which basically ensures that the the, the standard operating procedures are met but in addition to that, what Nigeria went on to do is that they developed something called the Nigerian Port Process Manual. Mm. If you look at that manual, it is it is fairly simple, uh, where it clearly articulates each step that a ship or a port user shall take and what they should prepare so that they can clear their cargo or clear the vessel in a very smooth, uh, smooth manner. Now, the port standing task team, which is that response response team, basically ensures that this is implemented all the way down to the last page of that process manual. So their task is basically ensuring that the, the government's vision for ensuring transparency and consistency in applying the standard operating procedures are met. Mm. If it's not met, they will investigate the case. They will provide a resolution for ships real time we're not talking about a post audit, which happens three months or six months, but there's a real time resolution provided. Why? Because as both speakers alluded to earlier, that time is cost, time is money. And in order to reduce any delay to the vessel or the operation, that real time response was very, very crucial. And, and today we see the, the evaluation. If you look at the whole evaluation uh, process that we've been doing, in 2019, just to give you some uh, some statistics, in 2019, mm. we used we had 266 incidents that were recorded in the system. Mm. Uh, it is what the MSN collects, and over time, it reduced. In 2021, uh, if I if I remember the numbers very accurately, it came down to 121, and then it came down to ar around 89 cases. This year. Uh, maybe it's one or two cases that we are still talking about. These are significant improvement in the operational environment of ports and terminals in Nigeria, simply because the government was able to carry out an identification process. What are the risks? Mm. Put in some measures, not just in terms of policy, yeah, but yeah. also to operationalize policy on the ground. So, so this is this is what we have seen that has worked in Nigeria. It's a methodology. It's also a data-driven methodology uh, that speaks to uh, reform in policy, if I may, if I may say that. And, and we hope that this methodology uh, could work in other countries in Africa. Uh, why? Because once we rolled this out in in Nigeria and we saw uh, progress and success in these cases, 
we were able to put that uh, methodology in place in Ukraine, uh, in Egypt, and since last year, we have also rolled it rolled it out in India. Uh, again, these are some um, you know countries with very many ports. Uh, a lot of operations goes uh, goes around on a daily basis. So any delays is a huge impact for the ports development, uh, the, the the GDP of the port, the the state, the the country itself, and and the globe. So so I think the methodology has worked for us. Uh, and again, it it did not it could not have happened without the support from the government. And in this case, it was the Nigerian government uh, and the institutions in Nigeria that really uh, work with. Uh, you know, we we could work with. Uh, to to have this kind of success and and progress. Thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you, but let me go to Captain and uh, find out whether he's back on the line. Good evening, Captain. Once again. Yes, sir, Kennedy, I'm back. Oh, great. So you uh, make your submission when we lost you. Can you uh, continue from yes, where you left off? Yes. That... Yeah. Yeah, I was saying that, for instance, if there's a fine of about $60,000 on the vessel, and in addition to that, this, um, the deficiencies was going to go into the database. That probably was going to go a long way to label the ship as, for instance, a high-risk ship. Right. And the master would have a lot of questions to answer to the company. He would be prepared to give, for instance, an official about $10,000 so that he forgets about the $60,000 and then forgoes the inclusion of the deficiencies in the database, for instance. And this happens a lot. Um, the way out for us was for the authority to sit and then we realized that if you had old my master mariners, old chief engineers who were self-made and just were so tired of sailing and wanted to come home. If you employed such people of such caliber, the probability that they will fall for these things was very little. And that's what we did. So presently, the authority has a lot of such uh, old seafarers. And then we have young ones that are being trained. Mm. And I can tell you when the post control officer picks his bag, and he's going on board, he has water, he has everything. So we have been accused by some of the shipping agents that uh, we don't even want to take water on board the ship. Well, the idea is not to take anything at all because you take one small thing and then it becomes something else. The line is so thin, we don't want to even look at the line. So that's what happens with us. And that's how come we, we are conquering this thing about the bribe and that kind of thing. It is really both ways. For us, the other side where the officer was asked is completely out. That one is, is out completely. The problem is when you are approached by the ship officer and it mm. happens very often. So long as you have deficiencies that will go on record, that will be a taint on the ship's name and company will come, will come troubling you that has not stopped. It's still ongoing. Thank you. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, Captain. Don't leave us yet. Uh, we'll be with you until the end of the show. I'm going to Mr. Pampa now and to find out from you why you think it's important to have uh, standardized oper operating procedures uh, from all actors across the industry in Africa. Well, the, the first thing is that you cannot establish an infraction if there's no standard. So that's the first thing all sides need to agree. Right. What is the standard for me to meet? What is the evidence that is required for me to show you I have met it? Mm. So that it becomes objective rather than based on the discretion of the officer. Then even the seafarers know, ah, in this case, we're wrong. Okay, this is a genuine fine. We need to pay and we can remedy this. We'll try and do it import here mm. or um sir all evidence shows that i have met it so why do i have an infraction and they can escalate the issue and if there's an ombudsperson that can help them also get relief um so that uh, there's an independent party that looks at the standard of evidence and then upholds it and says no in this case the vessel is correct they have met the standard sorry uh please you cannot give a fine for that. 
So that is why you need it. Otherwise, you can't have a level playing field mm. and you don't have any way of arbitrating very quickly um, between the vessels and their agents and the public official on the other side. Mm. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, quite awesome. And uh, very lucid there. I would uh, come back to Captain, but let me go to uh, Vivek. And uh, uh, in your opening speech at the Vessel Clearance Workshop, which was in Ghana here, you noted that evidence-based uh, methods of analyzing corruption risks are key in your agenda. Vivek, can you tell us about this? And uh, what are some of the data-driven research uh, that your outfit has come up with uh, or encountered in your dealings so far? Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you for that question. And it's an important one. Um, many of us must be familiar with the perception-based indices that, that are available globally on countries. Uh, when MACN started its work, uh, it was very, very important to understand how we're going to measure, uh, one, what is the problem, what is the quantum of the problem, and very importantly, how are we going to measure progress, if, uh, you know, if there is any progress, because uh, shipping for many, many years have been struggling with this uh, challenge. It is not a new challenge. Um, so in order to address that, uh, we very, at the very beginning, when MSCN was established, it started off with what we call an anonymous incident data uh, reporting system. It is still, it is still there. Uh, 10 years on, I must say, or 10, 11 years on, I must say, we have been collecting this type of incident data, uh, which is not a perception of what happened in the port. Or uh, what I mean by that is when I came to a port, it is not me telling you how I felt, how the public official uh, behaved in front of me. It is what happened, what transpired, and that is something that I can uh, uh, share with MACN. So it is a simple form that uh, anyone can, can report, and it is on our website. And today, over the last 10 to 11 years, we've been collecting uh, data, and we have more than 53,000 incidents reported all across the globe. It covers, if I'm correct, almost uh, 150 countries, uh, close to 1,200 ports. So we have data from all over the world where it shows that no country is immune to this challenge. No port is immune to this challenge. And um, th there's a slide that we normally share. You can actually see the dots all across the globe where these problems are reported. And it looks like a pandemic that never... Uh, you know, went away with no vaccination shot, unfortunately. So, so this is something that we were very, very clear that it has to be factual. It cannot be a perception. Why? Because when we go to governments, and as I mentioned in, in the uh, opening presentation, that the philosophy of MACN is very clear, and it is to work with governments, with civil society, and the local private sector, which means that we need to demonstrate factually as much as possible that what is the problem in their respective ports and terminals. And that was very instrumental for us to work in Nigeria as the work, as I mentioned, the flagship project that we started uh, with the government in Nigeria. It has also been instrumental in other countries like Argentina, Ukraine, India, and so on. So a data-driven, uh, a more factual data-driven, not a perception-based uh, data-driven approach is very, very instrumental for our work. Otherwise, it becomes uh, a discussion of, well, it is, it is very subjective. Uh, it is what you felt versus someone else felt. Uh, but this is going down to the nuts and bolts, as we say in the shipping terminology, of, of what the problem is. And that is what we've been trying to demonstrate. That is one part of it. The work we've been doing in Nigeria and a few other countries also demonstrates in not, uh, in not just anonymous data, it goes down to much more detailed information uh, and again, going back to what Soji said, we were able to clearly demonstrate that immigration is one of the challenges in Nigeria simply because uh, companies, that is private sector, were willing to share detailed information on what happened on board, who were the actors, what really transpired in actual statement of facts. Now, that was a supplement to the anonymous data because that was able to shed light more into uh, what are the uh, what are the details of the problem that we're talking about? Again, Captain Williams talked about the port state control related challenges. Today, we have sufficient data that goes beyond the anonymity part and goes into uh, showcasing or shedding light into where that requires regulatory uh, reform or where there probably requires where there is too much of regulation uh, because too much of regulation can also be uh, a place where 
um, some of these um, challenges are being faced by the shipping industry. Mm. So, so data or more factual data driven approach, we strongly believe is very, very important for both the public sector and the private sector to come together in finding some partnership uh, and finding mutual solutions. Right. I hope that answers your question. You have, you have, you have answered the question. Um, you guys, gentlemen, please still stay with us. We're going for a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue the show. Viewers, uh, this is Ion Pod here on Metropolitan Television, and we're discussing how to adopt global best practices towards a corruption-free uh, maritime industry. With me discussing uh, the issue this night, or the topic, uh, Soji Apampa, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Convention on Business Integrity, CBI. He's based in Nigeria. We also have Captain, uh, Captain William S. Thompson, uh, who is Deputy Director of Surveys and inspections at the Ghana Maritime Authority. And you also just heard Vivek Menon, who is an Associate Director, Global Operations and Industry, a Maritime Anti-Corruption Network. They are based in Copenhagen. We're going for a quick break. When we bounce back, we'll continue the show. Please do stay with us. Every now and again, Goyle makes good things happen. This time, Goyle has introduced Super XP Run 95, a higher grade fuel loaded with additives and yet sold at the same price as normal fuel. Goal Super XP Run 95 enhances engine performance like never before. It maintains the engine by keeping it clean from carbon deposits. Goal Super XP Run 95 is designed to burn slowly and thus improves fuel economy, making you save money after several kilometers. Goal Super XP Run 95 gives you a smooth driving experience that is less vibrations. Fill up with Goal Super XP Run 95. Now there's no need to pay more for any higher grade fuel. Goyle has that sorted. Goyle, good energy. Because you see, without our taxes, we wouldn't have good roads, good schools, better hospitals, street lights, and other very important social amenities. When we pay our taxes, we give our children free and quality education. Tell that my money too small. Why should I pay my tax? Look, small. Sell it for. It doesn't matter how small or big your business or income is. You still have to pay your taxes. The little taxes from each and every one of us, when put together, could give your community clean water. Or that deprived school with tables and chairs. Please pay your taxes. It is your responsibility. It is your civic duty. It is the law. Impressive factory. If only I had listened to you, I wouldn't have been in this mess. That devastating fire virtually wiped out the whole factory and my warehouse. Remember my misfortunes last year? Serene insurance assets all risk fire policies that I took were there to pay for my damaged stocks in the warehouse. And my machines that were affected by the flood have been replaced. My accident vehicle is back on the road. Thanks to Serene Insurance Motor Policy. Currently, my goods are on the IC covered with their marine cargo insurance policy. I was just telling Ajima about Serene Insurance. Oh, Ajima, tell him more. As a road contractor, I make sure I do my contractors all risk insurance for the projects and then workers compensation for all the workers on site with serene insurance they will make sure they will cover your unknown tomorrow today serene insurance a new face of insurance call us now MPS Terminal 3 is Africa's new state-of-the-art container terminal at Tema Port. For manufacturers, agro-processors and traders, the new port means business can be done faster. This infrastructure boost will improve Ghana's port handling capacity, connect more trading routes and oil the engine of growth for the economy, creating greater opportunities across all sectors as Africa's markets merge and become the largest trading bloc globally. MPS, we connect, you thrive.
All right, you're welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Ion Pod here on Metropolitan Television, and tonight we are discussing how to adopt global best practices to ensure a corruption-free uh, maritime industry. We have three guests who have all joined us via Zoom. Uh, we have Captain uh, William Eson Thompson, Deputy Director of Service and Inspection at the Ghana Maritime Authority. We have Mr. Soja Pampa, Chief Executive Officer at the Convention on Business Integrity, CBI, based in Nigeria. We also have Mr. Vivek Menon, Associate Director, Global Operations and Industry, Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, MACN, based in Copenhagen. These are the three gentlemen we are doing the discussion with. I've been told by the production team that we can activate the phone lines. And so the number to dial is 0205528353. 0205528353. You can call in and contribute to the discussion. We have some messages here. We'll be going for them uh, pretty shortly. But let me uh, come to Mr. Uh, Apampa and find out from you um, why your outfit views public partner, uh, public-private partnership ask the way forward for uh, you know to get to desi to get the desirable solutions that we require as far as the issue of corruption is concerned in Africa yeah thank you uh, that 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 is key actually because you know government with the best will in the world government will not have all the resources that are required to monitor what everyone is doing and if you cannot monitor what everyone is doing then your ability to regulate what they're doing is, is compromised so, somewhat. So no government has the, the resources to be everywhere at, at all times. We also need for the private sector, therefore, to be self-regulating up to a point. But if you're in an environment that is already corrupt, self-regulation can only be, go so far. And when it comes to activism by end users, even that is compromised. So at the end of the day, the only way to strengthen the regulatory environment is when you have collaborations between government, business, and civil society, and everyone puts their best foot forward in order to strengthen um, and level the playing field for all players so that the beneficiaries get more out of it, the private sector gets something out of it, and the regulator also is able to have better control. So that is the reason why this public-private approaches are much better than leaving it just to the public. Mm. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let me come to uh, Vivek, and then we'll come to some messages that we have here. Vivek, um, I just want to find out from you what your sense of, uh, you know, appreciation is in terms of political commitment from governments uh, in your quest to ensure that you have a corruption-free uh, maritime industry? Thank you uh, for that question and also another important one. Um, our sense over the last years working in different jurisdiction, I must say that um, there is a varied sense of political commitment uh, observed and also I'm speaking in, uh, from the African context as well mm. in the, across the sub-region. Uh, some some leaders have shown great and strong political commitment towards uh, uh, advocating on some issues like human rights, good governance, economic development, anti-corruption or ethical uh, behavior. But at the same time, we also see some are being criticized for lack of commitment of such. Uh, but if I may be more specific, again, the work going back to the work in, in Nigeria, uh, the tone from the top was very clear. Um, and that is what we were able to also harness. And I think uh, what that also means is that the drive for ease of doing business and how do you ensure that uh, you're, especially on the sector specific area, which is, uh, you know, the ports and terminals today, anywhere in the world is a service delivery sector. And if you don't perform, uh, that means the businesses will look for other places to, to carry, conduct business. Yeah. So it is very, very important uh, that we get the tone from the top. And in this particular case, uh, it was very, uh, very clear that uh, we need to find solutions together with the private sector that works. Therefore, we make our ports and terminals very, very efficient. Mm -hmm. That also means that the institutions, that the leadership from the institutions, and in uh, again, uh, giving you examples from Nigeria, it has been the, the likes of ICPC, the Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, also various other institutions that support them, the Nigerian Shippers Council that works very closely with them, um, uh, the, the Department of State uh, Security Services, and also the Niger uh, Nigerian Ports Authority, which all form, form the sports standing task team that I mentioned earlier. 
they were also very instrumental in working together in finding this common solution that works for all. Now, similarly, we we are we have been working with other other governments in different jurisdictions. So the tone from the top has to be clear. They also have to uh, walk the talk. That is also what we have seen. Uh, from institutions and from the various governments that we work with. It is work in progress, I must say. Uh, therefore, I think institutionalizing the work that we do is something we constantly seek out uh, from a long-term sustainability perspective. So um, so, so this is our, our vision as well going forward. How do we work in different jurisdictions? How do we work with institutions? How do we uh, create that accountability framework which will sustain uh, irrespective of how long I or anyone else remain in this uh, maritime industry. So, so that has been our experience, and we continue to seek uh, broader experiences from various jurisdictions that we will work uh, in the future. Mm. All right, I'll be coming back to you. And when I come to you, I would like to find out from you how your, your collaboration with the IMO has been over the years uh, since the inception of MACN. Uh, okay, I understand we have somebody on the line. Um, good evening. Okay, all right. I, I understand we've, we've uh, lost the person, but let me find out whether Captain is still on the line. Hello, good evening, Captain, once again. Hello, yeah, Cap yeah, yeah. Yes, Captain. Okay, I just want to find out from you uh, what the steps are, what some of the steps are that the Ghana Maritime Authority is undertaking to ensure uh, that we have best practices and that uh, in terms of vessel clearance and uh, other activities in the maritime industry. It comes back to um, what I said, but before I go to that, let me quickly bring in this one. Um, when I was talking about the fines and other things, um, you know, it's important to emphasize the processes we have put in place in order not to unduly delay ships. Mm. For instance, if a ship is fined, we have a form of undertaking that once you agree to the guilt, the agent, local agents uh, for the owners would only have to sign that and then the ship is free to go so that we don't delay the ships. And whilst the ship is gone, you still have the chance to come and protest to the authority if you felt you were wrongly fined or something like that. So I just wanted to touch on that one uh, mm. in addition to what I said earlier. Now you are asking about the steps that the authority has put in place. Yes. For clearance of vessels. Yeah, to, now, to, ensure best saying, to ensure best practices in the clearance of vessels and, and that things are done with. That's what I was saying, uh, Kennedy. Take, take, for instance, GPH is the landlord of the port. Yes. GPH has its purposes. So we will have to tie it into the discussion that um, Vivek and Soji have earlier on saying, harmonizing the processes right. so that the various institutions can come together and understand each other mm. because the authority cannot for instance cross the line into GRA's jurisdiction yeah. and start making rules for GRA simply because the authority thinks that we have to clear vessels quickly yeah. same way authority GPHA has its rules and SOPs the authority cannot cross those lines so yeah. it is a very difficult question to answer for all the other institutions, it can only be answered for the authority and what we do. Mm. And I'm saying that for ships, I mean, what we do is to inspect ships to make sure they are safe yeah. and there are processes. And we being part of the Abuja MOU, the guidelines are very clear as to what to do, what not to do, and how to do it. Mm. So with regards to clearance of vessels, that is where it stops for the authority. So probably... Vivek will have to come in-house and uh, start introducing the uh, harmonized system. That will be very, very important. And then he talked about the port manual. That makes it easy. Everybody has to look at it. And then we know what processes we have to follow. Yeah. For now, unfortunately, we don't have that exactly. And I think that's what we should be looking at. Um, Sorry, but I don't have that full mandate over all the processes of clearance. Uh, mm. I hope uh, you haven't gotten me wrong there. Mm. All right, I have this question here, uh, which says, uh, this uh, question goes to Captain, uh, Captain Thompson. Aside the vessel clearance issues in the industry, are there other corruption-related activities that spring up? My name is Esther. 
Um, definitely, definitely, there will be other corruption related activities. I'll give you a, a very interesting example. Um, one of the representatives of the agencies, local agencies in Tema, mm. realizing that there were instances where post control officers went on board ships to find them. What he did was he goes ahead to the ship, of course, he's the agent, so he's part of the clearing party. He goes ahead to the ships and tells the captain, please, if you don't want trouble from these uh, post control officers, you give me $2,000 and I'll go to them and then settle them before they come on board the ship and then you don't have trouble. Otherwise, when they come on board your ship, they'll find trouble and then the deficiencies will go against you and then they'll find you more than that anyway. Right. This is something this didn't happen. And that's outright, outright corruption, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. A very unfortunate, unfortunate one at that. So it's very vast. But like I said, for us, in our narrow channel, we, we keep it very tight. Hmm. Apart from the fact that I told you we have employed, capable people, self-made people, we have systems, weekly reports that we have to look through. And if any of the parameters fall out a little, that means that it calls for an investigation to find out what exactly is going on. Is it that somebody is not doing something? Is it that somebody is going wayward? So for the authority, I would say presently, we don't have much problem there. But then it's not only the authority, it is all the other institutions. So I really would welcome a similar system that uh, MSCN has introduced in Nigeria and it will make it uh, easy for all of us. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Captain. Uh, please don't go yet. Uh, we, we are likely to have more questions for you. Uh, this one goes to um, uh, Vivek. He says, my name is Brian in Tema. When will MACN implement this strategy in Ghana? Vivek. Yes, um, thank you for that very, uh, very good question. And yeah. um, I, I wish I could say yesterday. Uh, and I also <laughs> like that Captain William already uh, has mentioned that we should, we should be play, uh, you know, working closely uh, with the various agencies in Ghana. And this is also what we are working to do. So there is an expansion uh, uh, project for us, or mm. it's not, a, not necessarily a project, the MACN expansion program in itself is looking, after, looking at Western Central Africa to start with because we want to see how we can, uh, how we can work together with various uh, agencies and governments across the Western Central Africa. So this is already, uh, uh, you, say, you could say, initiated. The conference that we hosted um, where Ghana uh, helped us host the whole conference, Ghana Matam Authority was also instrumental in supporting us host the conference on the 19th and 20th of January this year, also showcases our next steps. You know, we want to um, take that further. In the coming months, coming years, we will see a lot more work being done in Ghana and also in the neighboring uh, countries. So, so that will be my answer to the question. And mm. if, you, if you allow me to the previous question, just to support Captain William, if I may okay. uh, just quickly mention what I failed to uh, recognize is the work in Nigeria also uh, touched on not just vessel clearance. It also speaks to the other side of the coin, as right. if, if I may call it, the port side of the, uh, of the challenges. Because um, shipping is a large value chain in its own. You know, it ha it's a cradle to grave journey of uh, the ship is built, it's registered, you have operations and then finally it goes into um, uh, what it's called demolition phase as well but yeah. as much as that the logistics of movement of commodities and and cargoes is very much in the port or the terminal corridors or if you want to call them the trade corridors and the question was very specific are there more risks or corruption risks and the answer is yes all across this value chain in shipping there is risks uh, ha there is corruption risks in various uh, various legs of these value chain. Mm. And in Nigeria, what we have now identified is let's let's clear the vessel, which is which is all fine potentially now. But once the cargo is landed on the port, until it reaches the warehouse or until it reaches the end consumer, there is also risks in that value chain. And that is also something that the government of Nigeria is working very hard to see how we can map that very categorically and then find solutions to fix those problems. So again, this is something we see in other countries and other jurisdictions as well. So it is not just alone to the vessel clearance part, but it is a whole value chain that needs to rethink its, uh, its work streams. It needs, to, it needs to look at where are the uh, integrity risks and how we can find solutions to that. that I just wanted to support 
uh, what Captain William uh, mentioned there, that there are various other risks uh, that we are also seeing. We, we, we know of these and we want to see how we can work more broadly on these topics. All right, another viewer sent in this one, and I, I think it's still for, for you, Vivek. It says, why is Africa being targeted? Is it that corruption in the industry is only present here? This one is from Cindy. Yeah, thank you for that question, Cindy. And I must be very clear that uh, we are not targeting any continent, any country here. Uh, I mentioned in, my, in the data question that you raised with me, the problem is global. Uh, the way I see it, it's a pandemic that's been sitting for many, many years with, unfortunately, there is no vaccination for it. What I mean by that is the data that we see and we have collected demonstrates that every there is 151 countries mm. that are affected by this problem in the ports and terminals. Right. There are close to 1,200 ports that is affected by this problem. So it, it is not the continent of Africa. Right. It is not countries in Africa. Uh, that uh, that are having these challenges. It is all over the globe. We have issues in the continent of South America, in North America, in Europe, in Asian countries, South Asia, Southeast Asia. So, so the the problem is is global. That's why I call it a pandemic, mm. and it is nothing. It is not specific about um, uh, African countries. So, so this is something uh, we are very mindful of, and this is something we want to work with every country that we see problems in. So, the question is very valid. Uh, from Cindy, but the answer is that this is a global issue. Great. Thank you very much indeed. This one goes to, he says, my name is Abu. Uh, can Mr. Pampa uh, speak to the obstacles they have faced in their quest to inspire a corruption-free industry in Nigeria? Mr. Pampa. Yes. W what is the question, please? Uh, the question I says, hear you very uh, can Mr. Pampa speak to the obstacles they have faced in their quest to inspire a corruption-free industry in Nigeria? The yeah, biggest obstacle is professionals saying, how do you want us to survive? If we deal with corruption, how do you want us to survive? And also the prisoner's dilemma. If I stop doing what is corrupt and the other person doesn't stop, well, they have some kind of competitive advantage over me. Mm. You know, which is why collective action actually makes sense. If everybody believes that this is not right, then coming together to find a common solution makes sense, makes more sense than asking one party to do so because that one party will have to bear the brunt mm. of any negative fallout on their own, right. which, which doesn't make sense. Yes. All right. All right, so uh, briefly, just in 30 seconds, tell us what Africans can do uh, to harness the full potential of the blue economy. Just in 30 seconds, we have barely a minute to go. Who to start? Anyone? Oh. Yes, Mr. Pampa. Yes, uh, final comments in, in 30 seconds. Yes. Very quickly. Ghana is already very well positioned in West Africa on the after. Ghana can actually, uh, with a few changes, continue to, to, and I'll probably get shot in Nigeria for this, continue to its lead in some of the uh, maritime processes where it's seen as being ahead. There's mm. stiff competition going on in West Africa, Ghana shouldn't miss the boat, literally. Thank you very much indeed. And the final word goes to Mr. Um, uh, Menon. Um, the same question. What can we do to harness the full potential of the blue economy? Vivek. Thank you. In, yeah, I, I would say primarily three things. One, we need to develop and enforce uh, maritime laws or shipping laws and policies to promote sustainable practices. It has to be sustainable. Long-term uh, visions have to be met. Two, uh, we need to invest and improve infrastructure. Uh, what I mean by that is not just physical infrastructure, but also um, human capital and, and the drive for ensuring that we have a more sustainable um, ports and, and terminals gro uh, globally. And that also means in African uh, countries as well. Last but not the least, and very important one, we need to foster partnership and collaboration between government private sector, international organizations, and very importantly, civil society, because that is the only way we can drive investment and innovation in, in the whole blue economy discussion that everyone is, is going after.
So, so that is, those are my, um, um, you know, immediate comments to how Africa can harness the blue economy Great. overall. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Vivek Menon is Associate Director, Global Operations and Industry, uh, Maritime Anti-Corruption Network, MAC, and they are based in Copenhagen. Uh, we've been speaking to also to Captain William Eston Thompson, Deputy Director, Service and Inspection at uh, the Ghana Maritime Authority, and indeed we've also been speaking to Mr. Soya Pampa, uh, Chief Executive Officer at the Convention on Business Integrity, and we've been discussing tonight uh, how to adopt global best practices towards a corruption-free maritime industry. I would like to say a big thanks to our sponsors, Ghana Revenue Authority, Goyal PLC, uh, Serene Insurance, Ghana Link Network Services, and indeed Meridian Port Services, MPS. Remember, the show is proudly powered by the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, GPHA, and the abridged version will be aired on Ghana Television on Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. Make a date and watch that one. Indeed, we'd like to say thank you for watching, and keep watching the rest of our programs here. Next week, God willing, we shall bounce back with another wonderful edition of Iron Port. My name is Kennedy Mona. Thanks for watching, and have a super evening and a super week ahead.